Okay, today's going to be a bit more of a teaching sermon today, so I'm going to go over some doctrines uh, in regards to the spirit and the flesh, so that you can understand that when you have this internal struggle, uh, what is going on inside of you. Uh, and I've got some diagrams that I put together, because I thought if I put some diagrams together, ho hopefully you guys are getting uh, a bit more out of the sermon when I put some uh, visuals to it, and then that way you can understand when I explain to you what's going on, it's not just you have to picture in your mind what I'm explaining to you. I, I put these diagrams together so I can give you a picture of what's going on in my mind as I'm explaining these concepts. So the title of today's sermon is The Stages of Spiritual Life. The Stages of Spiritual Life. And just like how we have stages of life, you know, when we, we are born, we're conceived, we die, there are different stages of spiritual life as well. So I'm going to go through the four stages of spiritual life and hopefully then you understand this concept. And as you understand this concept, then it'll help you explain a lot of the verses in the Bible that are often twisted to teach a works-based salvation or even a works-based assurance. Now, the first thing is, what I want you to understand is we, as a, as a complete being, are a three-part being. Now, some people don't believe that there is a difference between the spirit and the soul. I personally do believe there is a difference between the spirit and the soul, even though they are very closely related. But the Bible does tell us here in 1 Thessalonians 5, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So I believe that we are a three-part being. I don't believe the spirit and the soul are synonymous like some people believe. Some people believe the spirit and the soul is synonymous. Some people even believe that the spirit inside you is just the Holy Spirit. So that wouldn't make sense if the spirit and the soul are the same thing and the spirit inside you is the Holy Spirit because obviously you know, our spirit is not the Holy Spirit. We're not God. Um, that could be the case for Jesus Christ. But our spirit is different from the Holy Spirit. That's another thing to take note as well. So I believe your spirit and soul are separate, but also your spirit is not the Holy Spirit. So when, when we talk about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit, we have a spirit that makes us a three-part being a man, and then the Holy Spirit indwells our body as the temple of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, and that spirit bears witness with our spirit. Our spirit that where we believe is born of that spirit. So we are a three-part being. So I've put this diagram together. I'm going to sort of build off this. But this, this is just a representation just to get your mind around it. Now, it's not to scale. It's not saying that the body is more important than the spirit. It's just you have three parts. I've put it this way as we're on the earth. So that's the green. And the reason why I just made it that way, because obviously our soul indwells our body. And I think to a certain extent, our spirit I believe, kind of indwells our soul in a sense. And it's interesting the way these three things work. Um, different people have different theories. The way I understand how these three components work of a man is obviously the body is your flesh. So that's what was born of Adam. The soul is who you are. So when God created that individual, who you are as a person, if you can think about like your mind, your soul, your, your, who you are as a person is your soul. And then your spirit is, in one sense, it's how you interact with the spiritual world. So the soul is you. Your body is how you interact with the physical world. Your spirit is how you interact with the spiritual world. But one theory I have is, I think the spirit as well is what gives everything life. Because you know how Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So just like the word of God gives life, it's like the spirit that comes from God is what gives this life. So you say, well, the body without the spirit is dead. You see, the body without the spirit is dead, but the spirit leaves the body because the soul leaves the body. But then also the soul with a dead spirit is dead. So to me, it seems like this spirit that is from God is what is really giving life to the soul and the body but that's just uh, a theory that i have and just the way i see it so obviously this is not definitive in the sense that this is the only way it could work but just to give you an idea that there this is we are a three-part being 
and I believe body, soul, and spirit. Body is how we interact with the physical world. Spirit is how we interact with the spiritual world. Spirit is what gives the soul and the body life. And if the soul leaves the body, then the body has no life. Now, when it comes to body, soul, and spirit, I don't believe this is what it's talking about when the Bible says we are created in the image of God. Because a lot of people will say, well, you know, God is three in one. We are three in one. Now, I understand this can be used as an analogy for God to try and get your head around how the Trinity could operate. But I don't think it's a perfect analogy because, you know, I, I do think though in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. We know from 1 John 1, 1, it's with the Father, but the Word was God. You know, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We know that the Father is spirit. So there is an overlap when it actually comes to the Trinity. But, you know, the body is never the soul. The soul is never the spirit. There is a complete distinction between these three parts. And the body is not fully you. You know, the body is just one part of you, just like the spirit is a part of you. So, you know, but whereas when it comes to the Trinity, the word is completely God, 100% God. The spirit is 100% God and the Father is 100% God. So it's an, it's an analogy where we can understand the Trinity. But I don't believe this is what it's talking about when the Bible says here in Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he then. Now why don't I believe that this is talking about being created in God's image? Because man and woman have a body, soul and spirit. But women are not created in the image of God. So when we say women are not created in the image of God, it's not to take any value away from women. It's that this is not what it's taught. That your value doesn't come from being created in the image of God. When the Bible says man was created in the image of God, like literally man looks like God, like a man. But woman doesn't. Woman was created from man and looks different. That's why a woman is not created in the image of God. Of God even though she is an eternal being with the same value with body soul and spirit now why do I believe that well here it's very specific that God in his own image created man God created he uh, in the image of God created he him now I don't think that's an accident that it says that he created him in the image of God and then it says male and female created he them if you look in other Bible versions the NIV changes that to them Right? So then the, it's people that use the NIV, you can, can try and prove that man and woman was created in the image of God. Now, if you compare this to 1 Corinthians 11, you'll see here again this idea that man is created in the image of God, but not woman. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Look, but the woman is the glory of the man. So I don't even believe that the woman is created in man's image, Right? Because otherwise a woman would look like a man. So maybe thank God that a woman wasn't created in man's image. But the woman is the glory of the man, just like the man is the glory of God, but the man is created in the image of God. So that's, I don't believe that's what that is talking about. Now somehow, your soul is entwined very intricately with the spirit. So your, your body is indwelt by your soul, and I think the reason why people sometimes think that the soul and spirit are identical things is because I think they are very closely inter, inter, uh, uh, interrelated. Now, why do I believe that? In Hebrews 4, I'll give a shout out for Heidi for pointing this one out to me. But I thought this was really interesting because Heidi and I were talking about you know, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? And I'm like, I don't 100% know. So I was starting to think about it. But I thought this was a really good point. In Hebrews 4, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper, then any two-edged sword. Look at this. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now look at what it compares the soul and spirit to. The soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. So it's saying the, the analogy of the, of the Bible, the Word of God being a sword that is so sharp that it can cut between the joints and the marrow of your bones. Right? So it's like saying it's dividing between your bones and your joints. And look, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, how much difference is there between having a thought and having an intent? Right? But the Bible says that it's so sharp that the, that the, the two-edged sword of the word can differ, distinguish between thoughts and intents of the heart. 
So just like these two are closely related, and joints and marrow are closely related, it's like the soul and the spirit in the same way is closely related, like they're intertwined. And I think that's why when your spirit is dead, your soul goes to hell. If your spirit is alive, it takes your soul to heaven. Your, your soul goes whatever the state of the spirit is, but not necessarily the state of the body. So that'll give you a bit more idea why I sort of representing it like this. I was representing it before, like before I drew this one, I kind of had the soul and the spirit as just like two circles separate, but then I kind of felt like, no, I think, I think the spirit kind of gives the soul life. So, you know, and, and it talks about it being the inner man as well, right? Born again. So that gives you an idea. Let's go through the different stages. So the first one is spiritual creation, when God actually creates us. And we are obviously born of Adam. Uh, so uh, this one, we're, we're born of Adam, but God actually creates the soul and the spirit into that body to give that body life. Now, we are actually born, if you didn't know this, we're actually born spiritually alive. We are not born spiritually dead. Now, there is the doctrine of original sin from the Catholic Church and, and how the Catholic Church explains, you can't actually see that on this thing. That pink isn't coming through. I actually had the body as like a pink, but <laughs> it doesn't seem to be coming through on the projector. So when we, are, when we are born and when we are created spiritually, we are created spiritually alive. So when we talk about the concept of original sin, we don't believe that we inherit Adam's guilt, which makes us born spiritually dead. We are born spiritually alive. See, the Catholic Church believes, no, you're born spiritually dead. That's why they believe you need to baptize babies, you need to wash away that original sin so that if a baby dies, they go to heaven. No, we are born spiritually alive. That's why a baby, when they die, goes to heaven. Now, what is the true concept of original sin? Well, it's the fact that this fleshly body that we indwell as a soul and a spirit that's the sinful nature that we inherit from Adam. So w w this body is not created. This body is a son of Adam, and that's why we inherit this sinful nature, but this creature that is created to indwell that body, that is created by God, and it's created originally sinless, but it's created in a sinful body. So this is what the Bible is talking about when it talks about being shapen in iniquity. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. It's talking about this physical flesh right shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me so this is not conceived this is conceived and that's the nature that's sinful that it's talking about ephesians 2 among whom also we had we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature. So why is it saying the flesh and of the mind? So if you think about it in terms of this, because your soul is your mind. If your soul obeys the flesh, then that's the sin that it's talking about, right? The desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So the nature that it's referring to is this. We're by nature the children of wrath, not our spirit, um, which is originally created alive, and, and sinless. Now in Deuteronomy 24, the reason why we don't inherit Adam's guilt is because the Bible is clear that we, do not, we are not put to death spiritually for another person's sin. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So that is why we are born spiritually alive and this is also the reason why when children die when somebody whose spirit has not died yet when they die they go to heaven why because their soul has a spirit that is living that goes to heaven and do people have different theories it could be you know is it is it just a different case where somebody's spirit never died that's what i believe some people just believe as well that that's possible because you know jesus died for all sins so you know even if the the baby does have sin, you know, they're not held accountable. I'm not, I'm not too fussed either way with how it works mechanically, but we do know that there is an alive spirit that is not dead, and that's why a baby goes to heaven. Now, how do we know babies go to heaven from the scripture? Well, in 2 Samuel 12, we see the story 
of David's baby that died, which was the result of an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. It says here in 2 Samuel 12, 21, Then said, he, said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. So what's going on here? David's baby with Bathsheba of the adulterous relationship is struck sick by God and he's praying and fasting for this baby not to die. Then when the baby dies, his servants are saying, well, when the baby was alive, you were so sad, you were fasting and weeping. Now that the baby's dead, you just rise and, and eat as, as though, you know, it didn't, you know, as though it, it doesn't matter anymore. Verse 22, and he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I, fa wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So while the child was alive, he was praying for the child. But once the soul and spirit left the child's body, he knew that the soul and spirit had gone to heaven. And he said, I will not go, he will not return to me, but I will go to be with him. Right? So, so, so David understood that when the soul and the spirit left the body, as a baby, it went to heaven. So I would apply the same principle to disabled people, people that you know, have no knowledge of good and evil, like the Bible says, that when their soul and spirit leave their body, they go straight to heaven, and one day their body will be resurrected. So it's a shame you can't see that pink there, but um, that body's meant to be flesh, so it represents that when the body's alive, it's pink, and when it's dead, I gave it like this sort of gangrenous green. <laughs> so you know, when the body, when the Bible says in James 2, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So now you can understand now why when it says the body without the spirit, it's because the soul is leaving the spirit. The, the soul is leaving the body. The spirit is intertwined with the soul. So when it leaves, the body is dead on earth and the soul and spirit go on to be with the Lord in heaven. Now that's the first stage of spiritual life. So the first stage of spiritual life is that we are created alive spiritually. Now the second stage is spiritual death. So when you are first held accountable for the sins that you commit, that's when your spirit dies. And this is what we read about in Romans 7. For what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Right, so uncleanness. So you see here how the reason how he had known that he had broken the law is by the, by, so he so had broken the law is by the knowledge of the law. So why a baby or those disabled are still spiritually alive is because we believe that there's, a, there's a, a mental state where they haven't yet understood the law. They haven't understood yet that they can break the law, that they need to be saved from their sins, and that's why they're not held accountable. Now, we don't know what this age is, where somebody gets to an age where they now understand that they have broken God's law. The knowledge of the law comes to them, and now they know that it's wrong to lie and wrong to steal, and that's when I believe they also have the knowledge to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when somebody has the ability to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when they have the knowledge of sin and of the law. Now what does it say here? For, for without the law, sin was dead. See, that's an interesting concept. That, see, you have sin because as you're born, a baby is sinning as they come out of the womb. But the sin that they have is dead because they have no knowledge of the law yet. For I was alive without the law once. So what is he referring to? Right? He was alive both physically and spiritually. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So that's why when God says to Adam and Eve in the garden, in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And you think, but wait a second, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they didn't die. Well, they didn't die physically, but they died spiritually the day they ate of that fruit. And it's the same with us. When we are held accountable for our sins, the moment we sin, 
the first sin that we have, you know, the, the first moment where we're held accountable for our sins, when the commandment comes, sin revives, and then you die. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. So is he talking, is Paul talking about physically being slain? No, no, it's the spiritual death. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, so what is he saying here? Is there any problem with the law? No, there's no problem with the law. The law is not sin. It's just that when the law came, I realized I was a sinner and sin revived and I died. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So you see how as he learns the law of God, he realizes how sinful he is and then the spirit dies because the spirit was dead so we start like this we learn about the law we learn about grace we learn about these things somehow and then when we're held accountable for our sins our spirit dies now you might say well are we condemning people that are ignorant of the law by preaching them the law. Like if somebody's ignorant of the law, isn't it better that they just stay ignorant of the law and you just don't tell them about God's law, don't tell them about Jesus, and then they can just stay spiritually alive? No, because it's not necessarily from somebody explaining to somebody the, the law of God that makes them spiritually die, because the law of God is written on your heart. It's something inherent in every person. That when they get to a point, I don't know what that age is of accountability, where they understand the law is written in their heart, but it's also the time where they can understand salvation as well. Romans 2 says here, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. So you see, it's just something inherent in you that you know what is right and wrong. The things contained, these having not the law. So it's like, hey, these people are not taught the law of God, but are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So what is he saying? The Gentiles, even without the law of God, knew the law of God inherently, right? It was on their, con the law of God was written on their conscience, and, and even without being God's people, understood how to judge righteous judgment and not, because it was written in their hearts. So that's why somebody can die spiritually, even though they've never heard of, you know, necessarily the Bible. Or had somebody come preach to them and explain necessarily biblical concepts, they have that inherent knowledge and that's why they die. Now when the soul leaves the body, that's why it ends up in hell. Because remember, the spirit is what gives life. The spirit is dead. So when the soul leaves the body, which is your physical death, that's why some, the soul ends up in hell, but the body is still on earth. All right, let's go into the third one. This is the one I want to spend the most time on because this is where a lot of false doctrine comes into it. So once we, once we die spiritually, obviously now we have the opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ and what the Bible calls to be born again, which is the spiritual birth. So we have the spiritual creation where we're created sinless, the spiritual death when we are held accountable for our sins, the knowledge of the law comes, sin revives and I die. Now we have to believe on Jesus Christ to get the spiritual birth where our spirit is quickened again. And that's what the Bible is referring to when it talks about being born again. John 3, John answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, is being born of the water referring to baptism? No, because Jesus then explains in verse 6 what is the water birth and what is the spiritual birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So you see how you're born of water, being born of water is the physical birth. This is why when it talks about Jesus Christ, he, he that came by water and blood, Right? The water that he came by is the fact that he was literally physically born. He was physically born and born of water. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. 
that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So this verse is not teaching a baptismal regeneration, that water baptism is required for salvation. It's just saying, hey, you need to be born once, which is of the flesh, and then you need to be born again, which is your birth of the Spirit, that your spirit is dead and it needs to be reborn. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. It's the wind bloweth where it listeth. Um, this, this word listeth is where it desires, right? So it's the same as the word lust. Like guys, it, 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 it goes wherever it wants, basically, in what it's saying. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So you can't tell from where it comes and to where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So what is Jesus teaching here? That if somebody's born of the Spirit, you can't necessarily see that spiritual birth. He's saying it's like the wind. The wind you can't see. But what can you perceive of the wind? You can, you can see its effect. right? You can see it move things. You can hear the sound of it, but you can't see it. So he's saying it's like that with somebody that's spiritually born. You can't see their spirit, but you can hear the spirit. Right? You can hear the words that they can speak. You can see the, the effect that the spirit might have on the body. And he's saying this is how the spirit works but you can't necessarily see it like the wind. Ephesians 2, this is the quickening of the Spirit that the Bible talks about when we're born again. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love where He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. What it means to be quickened, it doesn't mean that you're made like the flash. It means that you are brought back to life. You know, it's the, it's the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's what Jesus said in John 6. Quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're born spiritually alive, we, our sin revives, we die. And then when we have the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and our spirit now is born again. Now this is what is important that you understand that it is not the Christian as a whole that is born again. You have the same flesh. Nothing changed about your flesh when you got born again. And your flesh is the reason why you sin. But when you got born again, you received the first fruits of the Spirit. Your spirit is born again. So now your soul can be saved, right? When it leaves the body, because the spirit is born again. But people misunderstand what it means to be born again. And they think when you're born again, it just, everything is new. Everything is changed. No, no, no. Now you have a dual nature. Now that you're born again, you have two natures within you. You have the body and you have the spirit which is what is warring, and your soul has to decide what to obey. So this is what we read in Romans 7. This is the inner conflict that, that Paul is referring to when he's saying, hey, there are things that I want to do, but I don't do. And then there are things that I, want to do, that, that I don't want to do that I do, right? And then there are things that I want to do that I don't do, because there's this war inside him that is going on. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So you see, here he's referring to this part. I'm carnal, sold under sin. So just keep this in mind as we read through verse uh, Romans 7 now. For that which I do, I allow not. See, this is a bit of a tongue twist of Romans 7, so I'll just break it down for you. He says, the things, this he's saying, the things that I do, I don't even allow, I don't want to do. For what I would, the things I want to do, that do I not. So you see this struggle, and it's both him, right? Because it is both him. But you'll see later on that he starts to identify with this because that's how we identify as the children of God. That's like our new identity, even though the body still is us. So you see how it's both I. I don't allow it, I do it. But what I hate, that do I. See, the things that he hates, because this man hates this, but he finds himself doing it because he's still with the flesh. Right? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. 
Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now he's starting to distinguish between the two, right? So he's saying, hey, I do the things I don't want to do, but it's not me that's doing it. It's this sin that's dwelling in me that's making me do it. Now, now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. See, he's talking about the flesh here. For I delight in the law of God. Look at this. After the inward man. So this, the inward man is that born again spirit that he is there as well. But I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now the reason why I think he can say it's warring against my mind because when you're born again, remember I was talking about the soul and the spirit being more closely intertwined than the soul and the body. So that's why when your spirit is born again, there is a bit more of a detachment from the body than the spirit. So he's saying, my mind, which wants to do right, but then he finds this law in his body, which is this, the, the law of sin. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, my flesh. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So you see, he wants to be delivered from being captive to the body. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Why is he saying that? See, because before, when you were spiritually alive, when you were a baby, then you know you, you were fine back then but when you had the knowledge of the law then you were spiritually dead now that you're spiritually dead you have no choice but to obey the flesh that's why somebody who's not saved all they do is sin because their spirit is dead and it can't cause them to do anything right when he says i thank god through jesus christ that with the mind i can serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin this is what he's referring to now now through jesus christ he has the ability to do right but the body is still there with him now it's so important that we understand this dual nature that is going on within ourselves so that we understand passages that refer to these two natures and we don't start thinking about a passage that is referring to the new man is actually talking about the body and the spirit and the soul as a whole because then you'll start getting messed up into false doctrine. So let me show you a couple of examples where we see this dichotomy, right? These two polar opposites, old man and new man. Now the first one here is 2 Corinthians 5, where a lot of people will talk about like, hey, well, if you're saved, if you're born again, then you're going to be a com you know, completely different person. You know, you're going to, all, all the things are going to be passed away. It says, then if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, if you were to just apply this verse to the whole Christian, it can't. Because it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And you say, well, that's a saved person. And you say, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, to the whole Christian, are all things new? No, because the flesh is still the same. The flesh is still the sinful flesh that we struggle with, that we fight against. So what is this creature, this new creature talking about? The creature that is in Christ where all things have become new. It's this. This is what is all new. That's the reason why you are able to fight against the flesh as a born-again believer because you have the new creature that is there. The things that are passed away and all things are become new. That is the new man that is talked about in Ephesians 4 that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you see there you have the choice of which one to walk in. Do you put off the old man or do you continue walking in the old man? If you put off the old man, you've got to put on the new man. But see, if it was automatic, if when you got saved, you were just a new man, it, it wouldn't even make sense for Paul to say to people, hey, you need to put off the old man. So you see how it's not automatic. There is a struggle that goes on. And that's why people that give in to the old man, they don't put on the new man. They're just the same person that they were before. Why? Because they had the same flesh that they had before. Nothing changed about your flesh when you got born again. The same son of Adam that you dwelt in before is the same son of Adam that you dwell in now. The same reasons why you did your sins in the past is the same reason why you do your sins now. It's just now you have the born again spirit where you have now the ability to fight that flesh and to put off the old man and to put on the new man. And that's what we are exhorted to do. So not only do you have the new creature, the old creature, you've got the new man, the old man. Matthew 7, where it talks about the good tree and the corrupt tree. Now the context obviously is false prophets. I'll just skip over verse 7, but it says, Beware of false prophets, you shall know them by their fruits. But this principle of the good tree and the corrupt tree. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Now some people like to use that verse to prove salvation use it as a, a basis for assurance of salvation now to me this is a terrible verse to use for assurance of salvation why because it says here a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit now if i'm using this verse to say hey I, this is how i know i'm saved you know what it's going to tell me i'm not saved because if i apply this verse to the whole christian and i say well the whole christian now that you're saved is a good tree well you better not have any bad fruit because if you've got bad fruit, guess what? You're a bad tree. Because the Bible says a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So now it just might confuse you because you might think, well, I've got some good fruit, but I can't be a good tree because a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So how do we understand it? Well, we understand it because... The good tree is this, and the bad tree is this. Now, can the bad tree bring forth good fruit? No, because it's sin. But the good tree only brings forth good fruit. So now you can make sense of the good tree and the corrupt tree if you understand the dual nature. But if you try and apply it to the whole Christian, you're going to get confused because all it's going to prove to you is that you're not saved. And all it would prove to you as well is that nobody can be saved. Because, you know, who can not have any evil fruit at all as a Christian? Nobody would be saved by that standard. So anyone that preaches work salvation is just condemning themselves or they're so deceived to think that they are a good tree. You know, they're, they're, they're deceiving themselves that they think they have no sin. Let's look at some others. This is 1 John 3. This is one of the passages that people will go to to talk about, hey, well, if you're a born-again Christian, then you're not going to sin anymore. 1 John 3. But you have to understand the two different natures. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. See, if you're going to use John, 1 John 3 for assurance of salvation, who would, who's going to have assurance of salvation from 1 John 3? Man, I'd hate to sit through an assurance of salvation Bible study and be turned to 1 John 3 and the Bible tells me, if you sin at all, you're not born of God. Right? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Look, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth right, not righteousness is not of God, but he, he, neither he that loveth not his brother. But now you understand the spirit and the flesh, the old man and the new man, and you can see, ah... That's what 1 John 3 is talking about. It's not talking about the Christian as a whole and saying nobody can be saved, right? Because everybody sins. No, it's talking about the new creature. The new creature that's born of God. The spirit that's born again of God is what is a child of God that cannot sin. But the flesh is, I believe, a child of the devil. 
right? And one day the, the flesh is going to be remade, not a child of the devil, and that's why it won't be thrown into hell. But those that are resurrected into their corrupt body, that's when they are, you know, are sent to the lake of fire, they're reprobate. Now again, we can see here in Galatians 5, a few more examples. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now this is specifically the example, the analogy, the Spirit and the flesh, because this is actually what's going on. It's the Spirit and the flesh warring in you. Now I don't, I don't really mind if this is the Holy Spirit or it's the Spirit in you, because your born-again spirit is born of the Spirit. So either way, it's uh, the Spirit inside you is the seed of the Holy Spirit. And this I say then, walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now so many people will say to you, well, if you're born again, you're just automatically going to do right. You know, you're a new creature, all things are passed away. And anyone who's honest with themselves will just think that that person's insane. Because all of you know, if you're honest with yourself, you struggle with the same sins, you struggle with the same things as a believer, right? So you don't want this wrong teaching of hey if you are truly saved you're not going to have the old desires anymore you're not going to do the old things you used to do and make you doubt your salvation what you've got to understand is that there is a spirit and there is a flesh and you're going to have those same desires but you ought to walk in the spirit this is what's being exhorted here he's saying hey this i say then walk in the spirit so it's not that just because you're born again, it's okay to walk in the flesh. Nobody's teaching that. We're just saying, hey, if you're born again, you, you, you could be the same flesh, but you're still saved. Even if there's no change, if you don't walk in the spirit, if you don't put on the new man at all, of course you're still saved, right? Because you believe on Jesus Christ. And that's why I think the, the, the analogy of putting on clothing, of putting, putting off the old man and putting on the new man is a great analogy because somebody may give you a new garment and you receive it and you put it in your closet you never put it on will anybody ever see it if you never put it on no but if you put on the new man that's when it starts to show forth that's when people can see that spirit that new man that is inside of you if you put it on so if it was automatic god would not need to command you to walk in the spirit because once you got saved you'd just be walking in the spirit right and it would just be just continue as you are no, but because it's not automatic, you need to be commanded to keep the commandments. You need to be exhorted and provoked unto love and good works to walk in the Spirit because it's not automatic. But if you understand this battle that's going on inside of you, you don't want to give in to the battle, right? You don't want to give in to it. You want to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would Romans 8, this is another one where I think there's this difference between those who walk in the spirit and those that walk in the flesh. It's referring to the old man and the new man. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So beware of that false doctrine that is out there that if you are saved you'll automatically live right you know that's just going to make you doubt your salvation you need to understand that when you get saved that there is a dual nature and then there is a tendency to sin there is the carnal mind and there's the spiritual mind now and we are exhorted to walk in the spirit but that doesn't mean the carnal mind is not there last verse on this point is romans 13 and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep Look at this, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now these are the sort of verses as well where people will try and trip you up and think, wait a second, I, I thought I was saved. If I'm saved, why is the Bible saying things like, well, salvation is nearer than when I believed? I thought I got saved when I believed. So this is why you have to understand the stages of spiritual life. Right? There are stages of spiritual life that you go through you start off alive, you die. When you're born again, your spirit is born again. But your salvation as a whole is not complete. Right? You're saved, meaning you can never lose your salvation because your soul has a born-again spirit of God. There is no way that soul can go to hell if it's born again. But is your flesh saved yet? No, that's what this is talking about. Where 
our salvation is nearer than when we believe why because one day jesus is going to return and when jesus returns our bodies are going to be risen from the dead and our salvation will be complete that's why the bible calls the born again spirit the first fruits of the resurrection the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness let us put on the armor of light let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness not in chambering and wantonness not in strife and envy but put ye on the lord jesus christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof so the reason why i'm going to this passage is just to talk about the different stages of spiritual life but also you might be thinking how do i overcome the flesh now that you understand that there is this spirit and flesh people struggle they say like how do i how do i get the desire to overcome the fleshly desires how do i how do i do right how do i stop doing wrong and i think there is a there is a some great advice here in romans 13 where it says put ye on the lord jesus christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof so how do you grow in a desire to do what's right because people say like you know i know i should be doing right but i just don't have the desire to do what's right and you know why you have such a low desire to do what's right because day in and day out you are making provision for the flesh day in and day out you are feeding that flesh i was always taught that there's like two beasts inside of you and whichever beast you feed more of that one's obviously going to be stronger that's why you've got to starve the beast you've got to mortify the deeds of the flesh but if you keep feeding the flesh right because you do things every day your mind you purposely do things you do things that are sinful you do things that you know you shouldn't you waste time you hang out with the wrong people you listen to the wrong music you, you do the old habits that you want to get away from rather than putting on the lord jesus christ how do you do that you don't even make provision for the flesh so you need to think of it this way you don't it's not just like say say it's like a, a bad habit you have whatever habit that is you don't just sit there thinking with willpower i'm not going to do this i will not do this one thing staring at it because you're making provision to be able to do that thing what you have to do is you have to replace that time with doing spiritual things so it's not just the willpower to overcome it needs to be replaced by something else See, it's not just putting off the old man and hopefully the new man comes you need to put on the new man to replace the old man so unless you start filling your life with spiritual things you know say with friends if you're hanging around with bad friends you need to replace bad time spent with bad friends with time spent with good friends see you need to you need to replace listening to bad music with re listening to good music you need to replace you know reading bad things with reading god's word so you replace bad things with good things and then that way you make not provision for the flesh and you will walk in the spirit and not in the flesh and the more you feed the spirit the stronger that spirit will become and the desires overcome the desires of the flesh that's how it works guys so if you're wondering why do i have such a small desire to do what's right it's because you're feeding the flesh all the time the more you feed the flesh the more you feed the flesh the more you not don't make provision for the spirit you know you're out of church you're not reading your bible you're not spending time in prayer you're not spending time in god's word you're not spending time soul winning you'd rather make provision for the flesh on sunday rather than make provision for the spirit well then there's no there's no wondering why this, this your flesh is so strong why your flesh overpowers the spirit all the time because every time there's an opportunity to make provision for the spirit you're making provision for the flesh see and that's, that's how it works it's very it's very simple not easy to do though understandably so the last step is the spiritual body which is the resurrection that's the last stage of spiritual life which is when you get your spiritual body so also is the resurrection of the dead it is sown in corruption it is raised in incorruption it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness it is raised in power it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body so first corinthians 15 says behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep 
Now, I, I believe sleep just refers to being dead, your body being dead. And I, I actually think it refers to both believers and unbelievers, whether it's sleep, because the body is sleeping either way, even for the unbeliever whose soul is in hell. Right? And one day that body will be awoken again to be judged. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So you see how this is not the same flesh that we're putting on. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So this putting on of the body is that resurrection, that new creature now whole. When it talks about your salvation is nearer than you when you first believed. And this is why in Romans 8, where it talks about the creature waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What is this referring to? Well, the new creature that is already a son of God is waiting for the manifestation of the Son of God, which is when we are given our new body and we are a Son of God completely, body, soul, and spirit. For the creature was made subject to vanity. See, that's the creature that is still in this world, right? Still struggling with sin. Not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. So you see how when we're born again, that's why uh, in John, John says, you know, behold, you know, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Because even though physically, not yet, we are a son of God, we can be called sons of God because spiritually we are because we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So don't let verses like these trip you up, where it says salvation's drawing nigh. I mean, this could even be applied. I mean, I was thinking about this last night when the Bible says, you know, he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And people say, well, it's just the flesh shall be saved. But it could also be referring to salvation because remember, we're saved spiritually. But then when Jesus returns, if somebody was to endure unto the end, their flesh would be saved. They would receive salvation. So you could still even say in those cases that saved there is referring to a salvation because it's referring to the salvation of the body. But what I don't want you guys to get tripped up, if you understand the stages of spiritual life, you understand the flesh and the spirit, you're not going to get tripped up by work salvation. You're not going to get tripped up by people twisting verses like that to promote work salvation. And you're also not going to be worried when you think, when people say, well, well the Bible shows that salvation is a process, there's stages to it. Well, in a sense, there is because you believe you receive the first fruits and then at the resurrection, you receive the salvation of your body. But what they mean by a process of salvation is that you're, you're not saved yet. You're not actually, you don't actually have eternal life yet at the point you believe. So when people say, oh, there's a process of salvation in the Bible, in a sense, that is right, because you have the first fruits, you have the stages of spiritual life. But what they're trying to teach is that you have a process to go through before you even obtain the first fruits, before you even obtain being born again, before you even obtain eternal life. And that is false. So once somebody believes on Jesus Christ, they have eternal life. They cannot lose that eternal life at all. That spirit and that soul is sealed. But we are waiting for the redemption of our bodies. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So you see how that new body is a creation. It's not a, a, it's not born of the Spirit like the new man is inside. That's why Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So just a recap, that's how we're born. Body, soul, and spirit. Spirit alive. Sin revised when the law comes. We, we understand the knowledge of the law. Law, the commandment comes, sin revived, and I died. Then the Bible says, Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirit is born of God. That seals our soul, right? Our soul is now alive and it cannot go to hell. So once the soul leaves the body, it goes to heaven, right? Because the spirit is alive. So I've made the soul yellow now as well because now the soul is no longer tarnished by the body, right? So the body is dead and we end up in heaven. And then one day at the resurrection, right, when Jesus returns, our soul and spirit is resurrected into a new body. And then we are saved. We are completely a son of God. No more to sin, to forever live on the new earth, right? Once the uh, old earth and the, and the heaven pass away. But what about for the unbeliever? The unbeliever in Matthew 10, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So you see how there's a time when the unbeliever is going to be reunited with his body and both soul and body are going to be destroyed in hell. When does that happen? In Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them. So you see how this is a physical resurrection that is happening here, but it's the resurrection of damnation, where everybody who is dead, their spirit is dead and their soul is dead, coming out of hell their bodies coming out of the sea and out of the earth right and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell were delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works so this is where at the great white throne judgment after the thousand year reign and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So you see how they are reunited with their corrupt body and thrown into the lake of fire. Now, why do I believe the lake of fire is also called hell? Because the Bible says that he's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, your body never goes to the center of the earth. Your body only once it's resurrected, you know, as an unbeliever, then both are cast into the lake of fire. And that's why it's saying here, he will destroy both soul and body in hell and why I believe the lake of fire can also be called hell. Basically, hell is relocated to outer darkness, which is the lake of fire. So this is how it works for the unbeliever. The unbeliever is born with a, new, with a, with a sinless spirit. And then they also spiritually die the same way we spiritually die. Now, they die in that state because the soul leaves the body and the spirit is dead, the soul dies and goes to hell. So immediately, if somebody dies as an unbeliever, their soul will be in hell. But their body is dead on earth. Right? You bury that body. People mourn for, the, you know, for, for unbelieving relatives and stuff, but their soul is not there anymore. If they're, if they're not saved, their soul is in hell, unfortunately. Now at the white throne judgment, their dead soul and spirit is reunited with that corrupt body. And they are judged according to their works. And because they have sin, now their whole body, soul and spirit is thrown into the lake of fire. As opposed to us, right? So that's not how it works with us. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an understanding of how those things work. Just a few couple of closing thoughts is... To recap, you remember that's how, we're, that's how we are now. How we are now is we have this internal struggle. So you need to remember that that internal struggle is there and you can understand why people that are saved don't necessarily live right. You say like, well this person, I, you know, this person is saved but they're out of church, they're not living right. That is possible. It's possible for a saved person to live exactly how they did before. Why? Because if their soul walks in the flesh they're going to be the same person but we are exhorted to walk in the spirit and that's where we'll start to see change if you put on the lord jesus christ second thing i want you guys to take away from this sermon is don't let people doubt your salvation when they point you to your works 
you know, because they're misunderstanding passages in the Bible because they're not understanding that there is this dual nature. And they say, well, hey, you'll know them by their fruits. You know, a bad tree brings forth bad fruit. If you have bad fruit, maybe you're not saved. Yeah, well, maybe they're just not understanding the spirit and the flesh, right? The body and the spirit. So understand this concept that's taught in the Bible so that you don't have doubts about your salvation. And you want to understand that there is this war within yourself so that you don't give in to the flesh, that you don't make provision for the flesh. Guys, we need to walk in the spirit. Don't let the flesh win this battle day in and day out. And the more the spirit wins those battles daily as you take up the cross, the stronger that spirit gets and you'll find it easier and easier to overcome the body. You know, you'll never be perfect, but, you know, um, hopefully you'll, you'll do better each and every day. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, we thank you for saving us and giving us eternal life. And no matter what we do, Lord, uh, we know we, have, we are saved. We have a sealed, born-again spirit and soul that when it leaves this body, it will be in glory with you. And we look forward to the redemption of our body. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand this truth so that we don't get tripped over by people preaching work salvation, works-based assurance. We can know that we're saved even though we still have sin. But help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit and to not make provision for the flesh. I pray that you give us grace, Lord. Give us power every day as we try and live for you. Help us to make provision for the Spirit and not provision for the flesh. So thank you, Lord, for delivering us from the body of this death so that with the mind we can serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.